So, Don, welcome to this week's edition of going back. We're going back in history. I think the the feedback last time uh, from our from the last one we did it was was second to none. And uh, and again, I'm quite sure you're going to impress and blow everybody's mind again with your your boxing knowledge and history. So this week we're talking about Max Schmeling and Joe Lewis uh, mm -hmm. and, and and the rivalry between uh, two fighters, two mm -hmm. two nations. And mm -hmm. um, uh, let's. I don't think we'll start with the first fight. I think we'll start with the background of both fighters. One being a, sure. a, a, a sort of a, a homegrown hero, a homegrown god in, in Germany, Max Mellin, um, mm -hmm. and who was nine years older than Joe Lewis. Mm -hmm. tell, tell, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more about him. Well, you know, for me in boxing, a generation happens about every five years. So Schmeling was actually two generations removed from Lewis. And the story of Max Schmeling, you know, he started obviously as a German fighter. He started out as a light heavyweight. And he came up in the shadow of Jack Dempsey. So Dempsey was this phenomenon, the biggest drawer, the greatest attraction probably in boxing history in terms of live gait and creating excitement. He came into championship just as boxing was becoming legalized in all the, the U.S. and the rest of the world. He predated the British Boxing Board of Control that started in 29, the New York Athletic Commission in 20, <laughs> the NBA in uh, 1921. And many of these institutions came about because of the popularity that Jack Dempsey created in boxing. So when Dempsey fought Tunney in the rematch and lost, both he and Gene Tunney retired. So you had the two greatest attractions. They had drawn a $2 million gate in 1927, which was unbelievable. Ridiculous. That's, about 20, that's about 20 million pounds in, in, in today's figures. Well, I would say it's almost close to the 200 million because you could buy a house then for you know, $5,000, a house now costs a half a million that you would have paid 5,000. Yeah. So it's actually incredibly how exponential. And remember, this was out any, without any television revenue. So it put everything on its hat. Now you're a promoter, you're in boxing, you're excited. Dempsey, Tunney, the long count, a memorable fight. Tunney wins in a, a second big upset. And what happens to both guys retire? It would have been as if Ali and Frazier retired right after their fight, or if Leonard and, uh, and Duran retired after that. The peak of boxing, the peak of interest, and the two big, biggest attractions walk away. So there's a worldwide search to fill those shoes, which was almost impossible to do. And they went through America with guys like Jack Sharkey, who you know rose to the top in light heavyweights, like Tommy Lagren, who came into that situation, and Young Stribling. And in Europe, you had Paulino Uskadon and Max Schmeling, who uh, you know he resembled slightly Jack Dempsey. And they built mm. him up over here as a guy. He's coming from Europe to take the title. It's the world championship. And after about three years of uh, tournaments back and forth and around Robin, he fights uh, Sharkey for the title and wins it ignominiously on a foul. The only time in boxing history that the championship yeah. won on a foul. So he didn't have much credibility, particularly with the American public, where, you know, if you box over here, Johnny, it's uh, no rules. Just uh, you fight till the death and <laughs> you get you bump heads, you get hit low, you get there's no disqualification. Just come back and try again. We've also got to remember that in Germany, in Germany, two thousand eight up to two thousand eight, I think boxing was banned until well, it wasn't. It wasn't professional boxing wasn't legal in Germany mm -hmm. at that point. So again, getting the respect from the Americans and the rest of the world, a German fighter to win the title in such a, a fashion didn't uh, get, go down too well. Didn't go down too well. So when he wins the title, he you know they're forcing a rematch with Sharkey, but Schmeling wants to defend it. He knocks out Young Stribling, who had never been stopped before. And he comes back and he loses on a decision that everybody actually thought that he should have won. Mm. And so they sort of gave Sharkey the decision. It was sort of like the rematch with Lewis and Holyfield. No matter how that fight went, Lewis was going to get that decision. You know, whether it was close yeah. or not, they figured they'd owed him from the last time. Mm -hmm. So now you can imagine with this phenomenal Dempsey and Tunney having retired like four years earlier, they get a championship that replaces uh, them. It with a with one run on a disqualification and the other on a terrible decision. So the public is really, you know, not turned on in the situation. But Schmeling had tremendous respect here. He was a great puncher. He had stopped Johnny Risco, had never been stopped before, only man to stop scribbling up to that point. So he still had great respect, uh, you know, from the fans. And of course, in Germany and Europe, he you know, was the first heavyweight champion of the world, uh, you know, aside from Fitzsimmons, who really was boxing out of America, but to win the world title. And then you have all the political ramifications with the Nazi party coming up, all this chaos in Germany. It added to that, Schmeling comes back, he loses to Max Baer, but then revives himself. So he's a formidable contender. 
And he comes in, you know, winning fights uh, when he came into the Lewis fight. So he had respect from people. You know, he was considered the guy. They thought he was going to have longer lasting uh, situation. I think if he got the third opportunity to fight Sharky, he would have won that fight. It would have been a lot different going into uh, the rest of his career. But he didn't and uh, ended up getting stopped by Bear. But he fought himself back. So he was respected and he was a former heavyweight champ of the world. Uh, again, and, 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 and also in, in America at that time, he was, he was, he was, he, he walked in as a hero. Even the, 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 the president at the time spoke German as well, yeah. spoke to him, spoke to him willingly, happily saying, look, I want you to win. So then when he comes in against Joe Lewis, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's brought in and people are thinking, wow, this guy, this guy is, 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 is a, he, he was a hero. He came in, cheered. He came in and, and, and Joe Lewis came in and, you know, the black side of America, they, they supported him and the white side supported the German fighter. So mm -hmm. therefore, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, I suppose, a, he had the support of the crowd away from home, away from Germany. Yes. Yeah, no, he was in, look, they said at one point in the early 20th century, the majority of Americans had some German ancestry in them. They were the largest influx of immigrants, you know, when they came in here as early as the 18th century. So he was really embraced, and particularly New York, you know, Yorkville with a very big German population, Ridgewood. He was uh, no, very heroic, and he carried himself well. There was no controversy about Max Melling. If anything, they, the perception was he got shafted. If you recall what the situation was well, later in his career, he fights uh, Starkey, the rematch. The famous phrase, we was robbed, was coined by Schmeling's manager, Joe Jacobs, in the, as a result of that decision. And then after he beats Lewis, he doesn't get the opportunity to fight uh, Braddock. You know, they mm -hmm. put their way out of it and to sign that big deal where Lewis, uh, where uh, Braddock uh, got 10 percent of the uh, of the uh, profits of Mike Jacobs shows for the next 10 years on Lewis to get him to pull out of the Schmeling fight. So he wasn't getting, you know, the sort of uh, just do he might have had he been an American. So, you know, there were no ill feelings. Schmeling was respected for what he did. On the we've, other also got, we've also got, got to respect that going into the first fight against Lewis. Uh, uh, Max Schmeling was the underdog. He wasn't, he was the older fighter. He was, you know, yes. Joe Lewis, is, he's a young buck coming through. He was the underdog. He wasn't expected to win. And under, no, under, I, underestimated by Lewis. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, he was at the sentimental favorite, you could say. I mean, to go back to Joe Lewis, I mean, he turns pro in 1934. Well, Max Baer had just won the title by beating uh, Primo Carnera. And you have to look at the situation there. As I said, Tony and Dempsey retired. You had a string of heavyweight champs who basically would win and lose every time they fought. You get Schmeling winning the title. He makes one defense and then loses to Sharkey. Sharkey defends against Carnera and is knocked out. Carnera defends, you know, he makes a couple of defense, Uzkadan and Tommy Lagren, mm -hmm. and then is uh, to a pulp by Bear. And then Bear eventually loses to Jim Braddock in a great upset. So there's nobody capturing the public imagination, black, white, or whatever, you know. Uh, and now what happens? Joe Lewis is, I mean, there's one word to describe him as phenomenon. He's an absolute phenomenon. He turns pro in 1934. Within one year, 1935, he's the number nine contender by the end of 34. You know, the first year as a professional, which was almost unheard of with mm. the amount of fighters you had active in those years. By 1935, a year into his professional career, he's the number two contender right behind the, the ex-world champion. So it's incredible rise that Joe Lewis has. He just comes up so fast and he's embraced. He's just the reports out of Detroit and Chicago are, you know, amazing when they bring them back to New York where the big promotions were in those days. And he's knocking out guys, you know, good fight. Lee Ramage he's beating and he's, he beats Patsy Peroni on a decision. The fight that probably brought him to the attention of most people was when he knocked out a fighter named Stanley Pareda, who was a marginal contender, had been top 10 about three, four years before. And Lewis blasts him out of the ring in about 80 seconds. And people were, you know, gate mouth. They couldn't believe this. And again, he was 19, 20 years of age and just blowing through. But they'd never seen anything like this in, in boxing. Well, he was a comet and, and an accelerating and fire. You, and, and you look at his record. I think his first 23 fights, he, he knocked 19 of them out. This guy was just, just, just cleaning up the division, second to none. Absolutely. And so when he comes to New York and he fights Primo Carnet, who was the ex heavyweight champ, and whether they perceived him as great or not, he still was a giant of a man over six foot five inches tall. Uh, he was uh, a heavyweight champ. He had beat Uskadan, he had beaten Lagren, you know, he was, he had beaten Sharkey. And Lewis comes in, demolishes him. And then again, the people are shocked. 
55,000 people in Yankee Stadium to see this fight. It's a black fighter, and everyone embraces him. He breaks the color line. They just know that this is a great fighter, and nothing else really mattered to the 99% majority of the people. They're seeing something. They're writing about him at that point as a great fighter. And then he fights Max Bear, and he becomes what is basically the de facto heavyweight champ of the world. People knew that Braddock got in on a pass, sort of like when Leon Spinks beat Ali or Buster mm -hmm. Douglas stopped uh, Tyson. They knew that he won, but they knew that in the rematch, they wouldn't, they wouldn't stand a chance. And, and so Bear was a guy they felt was champ, would have got, again, like if had Schmeling had the third fight with Sharky, would have won. Had Bear fought a rematch with Braddock, he would have probably beaten him. But he fights Lewis instead, a million dollar gate, the first time since Dempsey. So the, the, the fans, the promoters, everybody, the press were exciting for a new hero. He knocks out Bear, and this is it. This is not only a good heavyweight, this is a great heavyweight before he even wins the title. That, that's, you, you, so you're looking at the pedigree of both fighters. Joe Lewis, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's not giving uh, Schmelin the respect he, he, he probably should have done, you know, looking at this guy that was probably a little bit older, a little bit nine years older than him. He didn't expect him to, to give him that much, uh, um, uh, much trouble. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, Max Schmelin did his own work. He knew what he had to look for, knew what shot, he, what shot he had to look out for came, I think he watched um, the fight six months before they actually got in the ring together. And that's mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. the stories of both fighters, the lives of both fighters, yes. the real story began. Yes. Uh, how, how one can turn from a hero into a zero, zero into a hero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Joe Lewis, again, it's just like they were serving up Max Schmeling like a bratwurst on a platter for Joe, Joe Lewis to knock out and route to the title of Jimmy Braddock. And it was just, yeah. you know, window yeah. dressing. And one more champ. He had already at that point beaten former heavyweight champs, Primo Carnera and, and, and Max Baer. And he knocked out uh, King Levinsky, who was a top contender in one round. So this was a guy they found for him. He drew 30,000 people in Yankee Stadium. But by and large, Lewis, yes. And as you know, as a fighter, John, they're writing, it's going to be a slaughter. He's 10 to 1. There's no contest. One more stepping stone. You believe it. It gets into your mind and you drop down, you know, emotionally and, and mentally, psychologically, you don't have the edge. They say, oh, I'm going to beat him. And you start, they say, you believe your own press clippings. And that happens so, to many other fighters as well. When, you, when you're most heavily favored to win, you generally lose because I think it's more psychological than physical. Without a doubt. So June the 19th, 1936, this was mm -hmm. the night. This was the fight. This is what, what shocked American uh, mm -hmm. boxing fans, but lifted the German nation. Uh, mm -hmm. when this fight oh. took place. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. As I say, he beats the de facto heavyweight champ. Not only does he defeat Lewis, he knocks him out. He knocks him down. So I think that, you know, they had turned Lewis into almost this, you know, uh, one of these godlike figures who came down from Mount Olympus. So the press doesn't have a tendency to hype. It's not that Joe Lewis would not become this great heavyweight, maybe the greatest of all time. But at that age, I think he was just 21 years of age when he boxed uh, Max Schmeling. He didn't have the experience and it proved and Schmeling, you know, an older, wiser fighter who had been in with the very, very best, uh, learned from his mistakes. He knew what defeat was and he, he just perfectly planned out the bout against uh, Lewis, landed those right hands and, and, you know, those punches and dropped Joe and stopped him. So now this, I, I don't think people dismissed Joe Lewis, but they said, look, he's great, but he needs, you know, he's not what we thought initially he's not invincible he's human you know he has feet of clay and Schmeling revived his career as you said and got himself back on track in Germany and, and, and the world and he he was revived as a fighter he got a second life so you look at both fighters and at that point then what how did he go back and lick their wounds Max Schmeling goes back to Germany he was sort of a celebrity even before he boxed now he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's, a, he's a superstar. He's, he's, yeah. Hitler, Hitler wants him to sit by him to say, you know what, this is our race. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. Joe, Joe Lewis, there was, there was there was riots in Harlem. People, yes. they, they just, yeah. they lost it. They couldn't believe what had gone on. So now Joe mm -hmm. Lewis is thinking, I want to get this right. I've got to fix this. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so it, we, the fight goes on, life goes on. Then it comes to fight number two. Fight number two, I think, Schmann yeah. should have got boxed. JJ Braddock, Braddock pulled out through an injury. Joe yeah. Lewis ended up fighting and become a world champion. So now mm -hmm. the, the, the roles have changed. Now yes. Lewis gets in the ring as champion, even though he lost to Schmelin. Fight number mm -hmm. two. Talk us through it. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, what has happened? And by the way, after Lewis lost to Schmelin, he didn't sit around and brood. Eight weeks later, he came back in and knocked out Jack Sharkey, the former heavyweight champ who had won the title from Schmelin. 
So he came right back to reestablish himself. You know, in those days, if I didn't go to a psychiatrist and a therapist, and a psychologist <laughs> and a hypnotist, they went right back in the gym and right back. Can in you the imagine gym. that? Can you, kid down? Can you imagine that today? Can you imagine, no. I don't know, Anthony Joshua uh, getting straight back in eight weeks after losing to Andy right. Ruiz? Can you imagine yes. uh, uh, Deontay Wilder getting straight back in after no. getting uh, 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 pummeled by Tyson Fury? This is, it's a different breed of fighter. It's a different, it's a different even, a, even the gloves were different one. Oh, well, how, well, they're fighting sometimes with six ounce gloves, you know, and amazing and heavyweight. So this power is out there. No, Lewis came back and then he fortified Ali Tour, was the number three contender in Philadelphia, a tour's background, uh, back hometown. 37,000 people turn out for that. He fights Bob Pass. So he fights his way back into contention. And as they say, Schmeling goes to Europe, takes some fights. He thinks he has Braddock. They manipulate him out of the Braddock fight because they know Joe Lewis is the contender. And John, in the meantime, you see the rise of the Nazis. You know, they're not declaring war yet, but they're really in our presence. And this is really the, the they, they epitomize evil. Schmeling himself was not a Nazi. In fact, he ended up being paratrooped into a Greek. They don't do that. Use Greece with uh, during the war. They don't generally put you on the front line if you're a real hard party holder who is out there for propaganda purposes. But anyway, so he comes back. He's waiting for a shot. They get Joe Lewis into the title, but nobody's really accepting Joe Lewis as the heavyweight champ, including himself, until he fights and beats Max Schmeling. And the rematch is really this is for all the models. This is the fight. You can win all the titles. You can claim all the the victories, but until and unless you beat Schmeling, you're not going to be the heavyweight champ of the world in the public, in the press, and in your own mind. It's true. I think they, they, there was a lot of pressure, not just from both opposing camps, but both opposing countries at this time. Oh. Now, now, as you say, it's, it, all the marbles are on are on the table now. This is what we're playing. This is what we're playing for. So then, this is where uh, uh, Joe Lewis, the vintage Joe, Joe Lewis, who, who should have turned up the in fight number one in 1936, he turned mm -hmm. up to fight. He turned up to play ball. And, and Max Schmeling, you know, this is where you saw the difference between age, time, um, mm -hmm. wear and tear on both fighters in fight number two. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, this Joe Lewis was now in magnificent condition. His, his confidence is restored. He's won the heavyweight title. He had already made five defenses of the championship between beating Braddock and, and fighting uh, Schmeling. And he's on a, a winning streak. He knocked out... Um, I think he had knocked out John Henry Lewis right before the Schmeling fight in one round. So Henry Lewis, a great light heavyweight champion who had never been knocked out before. The only time in his career over 100 fights he was knocked out and in one round by Joe Lewis. So the stage is set. Schmeling had come over and won a fight. And again, the political things, the surrogate propaganda war between Germany and the United States, evil versus good. I mean, it's everything you need. Over um, eight um, and, and this time, the president of the United States, instead of inviting, inviting Max Schmeling to, to the White House to visit him, he goes to Joe Lewis, say, Joe Lewis, yeah. look, this, this is for us. You're representing us. So, so again, now Max Schmeling really, he, he sees how coming in as a hero and being cheered by his American friends, by the president, to, yes. to now being jeered, being booed, for cups and saucers and beer thrown at him as he's getting into the ring. The, the, oh. the, the president now going to his opponent. It's going to mm -hmm. have a psychological effect on you as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, Max Schmeling's American matter was Joe Jacobs, who was Jewish. And all these anti-Semitic laws are being passed, anti-Jewish laws in Germany. They're not being put in concentration camps yet, but, you know, they're ostracized. And New York, of course, where the rematch, well, the, first, the two fights were, has the largest Jewish population in America, probably one of the largest of any city in the world outside of Israel. There was no Israel then, obviously. So they probably have the largest Jewish population. And they had been a bit with Schmeling because a lot of Jews were German Jews. So they saw themselves as German as well as Jewish. But now, of course, with the political change, he becomes the symbol of everything that, you know, they could be against. So all of a sudden you've got... Uh, he just represents everything that's bad, whether he deserved it personally or not. He symbolizes evil. And Joe Lewis is the, the archangel come down to vindicate the world. So you've got this scene as explosive would be such an understatement. This is like waiting for the atomic bomb blast to go off. Mm -hmm. And you're there to watch it. Uh, the, the thing we have over here is a pantomime every Christmas, every festive season. And, uh, and you have a villain or a hero. And you have a love the villain or you love the hero. And this is what this fight ended up being it was it was they, they made Max Schmeling the villain Joe Lewis mm -hmm. the hero the fight mm -hmm. took place round one both fights feeling each other out then round and then about after after a minute minute and a half round one boom that's mm -hmm. where 
it all it all changed. Everything changed for both fighters. You'd think mm. in the ring it was successful, but outside the ring, again, it was a ripple effect of how life would be outside the ring after those fights. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's that famous uh, uh, passage in the fight where Lewis hits him and they could actually hear Max Schmeling scream when he got hit with a punch in the spleen and it agonized. And so you can imagine the punching power of Lewis. I believe that Lewis beating Schmeling was the greatest single performance by a fighter in boxing history. Knowing, as we said, John, the background, the rematch, he has to vindicate himself. He has to leave. He goes into the ring with a question mark and he leaves with an exclamation point. Now, this is great. This is maybe the greatest fighter who ever lived. And he goes, uh, his next defense, he knocks out a fighter, Jack Roper. But he has in his career three consecutive one-round knockouts in defenses of the world heavyweight title, an achievement that's never been equal before or since. Uh, so this was absolutely Joe Lewis at his 100% peak physically, mentally, uh, uh, emotionally. It, the package was there together. Nobody would have beaten that guy that night. And I particularly think you look at, Yeah, and you look at fighters, and with fighters like that, it's not what people say to you, it's what they say about you. And it's not what they say about you to your face, it's what they say behind your back. And, and Joe Lewis was, was, was revered to be the best by the best. The likes of Muhammad Ali said, you know, he was the best. He was the greatest. You know, mm -hmm. fighters, you know, he, you think Ali inspired fighters. You know, John Lewis inspired oh. so many people like Ali. So, but then after the fight and both fighters go, go get on with life, you know, Max Manning goes mm -hmm. back. It's, it's hard to swallow. It's hard to handle. And, mm -hmm. and John Lewis ca carries on. Life goes mm -hmm. on. But they tried to make out as though these two were the, 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 the worst of enemies. But in mm -hmm. reality, do you believe that was the case? No, I don't. I mean, they may not have been as close as maybe was pictured by the press, but they're certainly, you know, you know, as a fighter that you have great respect for the guys. And the guys who give you the best fights to probably have the most respect for. You know, and you go through a series of that because you go through it together, winner or loser. And, they, and there's a famous story where Max Schmeling, after the war, he was destitute. And James Farley, the former chairman of the New York Commission, got him the franchise for Coca-Cola in Germany. And as a result, he became, yeah, he became a wealthy man. And at times he helped Joe Lewis. They brought Joe Lewis over to Germany for personal appearances and they were seen together at many different functions. So I think the rift was ended. And of course, Schmeling had the most incredible respect for Joe Lewis as a fighter. But, but then you look at how America treated uh, Joe Lewis after he'd, mm -hmm. he'd given two of his purses to a, an mm -hmm. estimated value of $1 million uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to help with the, the, I think it was the, with, the, with the war fund, uh, mm -hmm. but still taxed on it, how he was treated and how he ended up, how life ended up for him. He was, was he a, a professional greeter down, down there in Las Vegas? Life and how he was treated by his country that he represented, mm -hmm. that he helped support, uh, was, was such a, a turnaround. Again, one fighter wins, one fighter loses. But outside the ring, the other fighter loses and the other fighter wins. Well, I don't think Joe Lewis ever faded from the public's respect, the consciousness of the tax. There's a lot of controversy about the tax situation. And Joe Lewis spent very freely on his money you got to remember, there was an 80% tax bracket in that day. So what killed Joe Lewis in terms of income tax? What happens to a lot of us, and you know, as an athlete, and I'm in the business, you make a payday here, then you don't make one for months. When he was fighting so actively, 1941, he had seven defenses of the heavyweight title, and, his, and he had two, the early part of 42. So he's out to break that record. And what he would do is he wouldn't pay income tax, so he would make it up. So he'd pay, take a purse, spend it all. The next fight, he'd take that whole purse and throw it into uh, paying the income tax because a month later he's going to fight again. Now he owes taxes going into the army in 1942, but he has three years within that with no income, with no basic income. So that tax bill that he owed, say it was a hundred thousand, it's compounding with interest daily, you know, and, and penalties. And he never could quite catch up after world war II, even though his biggest purse he ever received was fighting Billy Kahn. It's over a uh, half a million dollars in 1946. He was so far behind. It's interesting because Joe Lewis's manager, he also had a tax problem. Mm -hmm. You know, boxers don't seek out accountants uh, and they don't seek out tax advice. So it was a terrible thing. But many, many celebrities, many people depend on huge paydays, but paydays lengthy times apart. We all fall into that trap. As a result of Joe Lewis, what they did is start for self-employed people quarterly tax payments, estimated tax, which you didn't have in those days. You paid in one lump sum. So it was bad. And he was getting $100,000 a year from Caesar's Palace. So he wasn't out there with a cup and pencils in the street begging for money. And Joe Lewis, they had a saying about Joe. He was America's guest. Joe Lewis never had to pay anything. He shouldn't have to have been that. But he was making personal appearances and did look sad. 
But it happens to a lot of fighters who will round up a lot worse than, than Joe Lewis. You know, he was buried. He went, when he passed away, uh, Arlington National Cemetery is the, the most important cemetery in the United States. War here is Omar Bradley is buried there and, and people who won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Any veterans entitled to be buried there, but the waiting list is, you know, uh, six years long. So you can be buried and they disinter you. Ronald Reagan said, Joe Lewis was, uh, that's for generals in here. He said, well, Joe Lewis was my hero and he's a general in this country. He goes to the top of the list. So the president of the United States made sure that Joe Lewis got buried at Arlington. So he had incredible respect. He did have financial problems, uh, and uh, but many, many boxers do, many entertainers do. Uh, you see, when you tell that story, uh, it reminds me of my old trainer, Brendan Ingle in Mentor. Brendan always said, it's always the same story, different actors. And so the story you tell us about the financial woes of, of, of Joe Lewis is, I'm quite sure, like, like myself, you know, many, many fighters, but they're being trapped in the same situation, same. Myself, we all. Gone down the same hole. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. And, you know, hire a good accountant is the best thing. Well, here's the problem. Joe Lewis, is, in those days, a boxing manager managed your career, but they didn't manage your life. You know, now great fighters have accountants, they have the lawyers, they have people, tax consultants. In those days, the man, as I said, his managers wound up in tax problems. So they didn't have any guys. You didn't know, make a fight. We'll take the money. We'll pay it later. And, and unfortunately, that was a, the, the, you know, the, the uh, perception because the managers and trainers had no better education than the fighters. They were mostly ex-boxers who didn't have any education and particularly handling hundreds of thousands. We all came from basically poor backgrounds. But then you look, on the other hand, you look at Max Smiley. And Max, even though with, on many occasions he and Joe would probably get together for a publicity shoot, but he still helped him out financially. So when people yeah. look at this from the outside in, they see two fighters trying to beat each other up, trying to get the better of each other. But in mm -hmm. reality, you know, they are they are probably closer than siblings because yes. uh, it's, there's a bond that people most, most people don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, their careers are eternally linked. You can't say Lewis without Schmeling or Schmeling without Lewis. You know, it's just... Uh, it's become part of history. I mean, made a motion picture about them 60 years, 70 years later. I don't think there'll be a picture made about Louise and Joshua 70 years from now. Yeah. So, uh, how, so looking back, uh, probably is there a moral of the story? I don't know, but you're looking back. Is, it, is there anything that, that, that even uh, uh, emulates this, this story, this dance between Smellum and Lewis or, 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 um, or anybody or any fighter that you'd think it'd be heavily inspired by them. Well, I think every fighter should be. And the, the thing is, don't give up, you know, don't give up uh, because you can always come back. Joe did and Schmeling did, you know, and they both lived a different life afterwards. But Joe Lewis never was a minute out of being one of the great icons in American history. I mean, he transcended even boxing. Forget about that. Mm. Sports, forget about that. He's one of the most iconic figures. He's, he's probably as well known as, any you know, non-politician in this country. And what he did for black people in this country, you know, the people with kids, he's the first black man that a white family would invite over for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and he was the first black man to play on the PGA golf uh, as well. He was, he broke the color bar. He was the one that, that actually was a, he, the first to do that. He loved golf. He loved golf and everything. Yes, no, people would die to get pictures taken with Joe Lewis. He really was a truly an American hero. Uh, and he opened it up in baseball integrated here uh, decades after, you know, a few decades later, but he gave that inspiration that I could do it. And he inspired so many people because again, he was a great, great athlete. He was not braggadocious. He went into the service. I said, he became a hero going into the army and Muhammad Ali became a hero because he wouldn't. And it's trains the juncture in time with your actions, mm -hmm. what they were and how it reflects on things. But, you know, Lewis was uh, always, always revered and, and, and continues to be so. And as a great athlete, and Schmeling again, the first great heavyweight champ, the single heavyweight champ to come from, from Germany and Europe. And, and he conducted himself uh, remark that he was able to come back, not only as a fighter, but as a person after the rubble of war in Germany. And it destroyed not only the German people, the actions of Hitler more so than anyone else. And, and came back from nothing to build a business and, and, crawl out of that so it's a great phenomenal story it's almost a mythic kind of a story don every fighter uh, every 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 um every story has its own tale and uh, this has been an absolute pleasure as per usual you blow our minds with your knowledge and uh, thank you very much thank you john it's a privilege to be on the air with you